Curry County. Thank you, Emily, for that excellent overview. I'm going to touch a little bit on public health as well, because it is so important to our economy. Uh, the view from the coast. Um, so looking at the major trends influencing coastal Oregon and Curry County in particular, not only the atmospheric hazards, but geologic hazards as well. And the atmospheric trends, um, actually about a half a degree centigrade Fahrenheit per decade, for coming decades, yeah, that um, does mean uh, nice days at the beach. But, <laughs> and of course, precipitation more the same, but drier in summers. I'm excited about the increase in storm intensity and frequency. Um, my background as a watershed scientist included getting to study geomorphology. And <clears throat> so the idea that storm intensity is a pretty juicy hydrologic term that translates into landscapes move around faster. <laughs> but it turns out that this is really cool information because we could act on this if we decided to. And don't forget, of course, that important mean sea level rise. Uh, well, I was shocked in doing the research for this to discover worldwide average in the last century, 6.7 inches of sea level rise in the last century. That was stunning to me. Um, local elevations, of course, vary from that. That's a worldwide uh, figure, but interesting to contemplate what that means for the tides, that tides will be migrating inland over the next century. Ah, that is not a bend or a Deschutes or a Malheur problem, that's a coastal problem. Um, so looking at the coastal geologic hazards, um, I want to po point out that the chronic hazard and the catastrophic events, um, these I've taken from State of Oregon, uh, Oregon Coastal Management Program, uh, but because Kelly Timchak, is she here? Kelly, not here. Um, also want to bring to your attention some of the uh, features uh, specifically of the rogue estuary. The chronic hazards are the things that just happen more often. We see them, so we think about them more. Um, they typically are more limited in scope and severity, but by golly, when it's your driveway going down that gully, right, you're motivated. Um, I want to point out this wonderful work uh, by the uh, Oregon Coastal Management Program called Climate Ready Communities, a strategy for adapting to impacts of uh, climate change on the Oregon coast. Boy, it sure sounds like the state of Oregon is taking this seriously, doesn't it? And this is really good news for us. We can step into this dialogue and say, yes, chronic hazards, you know, these are familiar, right? Um, we, we love this, but I, I want to point out that this includes not only just erosion, erosion goes somewhere, doesn't it? But also the loss of soil carbon. As we see more intense storms, more, greater storm intensity, oh, thank you, means that the soils are more e er eroded. So we can expect to see um, a lot more erosion in the coming decades uh, under if, if business continues just as usual, right? I have an example here. Here's some houses possibly built slightly too close to a sand dune that are now threatened by wave erosion. Um, and, and so this kind of thing, uh, there's actually quite a lot of examples of this on the Oregon coast now, which we, our forebears tried very hard to prevent. Um, I want to point out, too, that the rogue estuary is now choking in sediment. Our rogue estuary is quite unusual in that it's only about four miles inland, compared with the Coquille, which extends inland more than 20 miles. The rogue estuary is only f about four miles long. And we have uh, seen from watershed analysis that the reach from Galice to Agnes, about an 80-mile reach, <clears throat> has responded to the timber harvest practices from the 1960s forward with a huge amount of sediment. There's relatively limited storage in that 80-mile reach, which means that sediment that used to be in the hills is now in the estuary of the Rogue with um, considerable consequences for the Rogue Basin. And because we've been in a period of relatively drier years, that means there haven't been the flushing flows to move those sediments out to the ocean. Um, that means that that sediment is 
filled in the pools, filled in the channels, and that our very valuable rogue fishery that we love to talk about has real risks, high ra hazard for those smolts that normally wait in the estuaries to swim out to the ocean. If, an, if a smolt is six or eight inches long, it has a much higher chance of surviving than if it's only two or three inches. Makes such sense. Estuary is critical rearing habitat for salmonid smolts. And those pools are filled, the channels are filled. And so, this is an economic issue, especially for Curry County, um, analogs on other counties, of course, those coastal streams. But I want to bring to our attention that what an opportunity this represents when we start paying attention. It turns out that sedimentation to the rogue estuary has really not received very much attention until now. But to give you some sense of it, think of this. You can now wade across the rogue estuary without getting your knees wet. Ah, do you find that shocking? I sure did. It is so full of sediment, you can walk across it without getting wet. So, rogue estuary, very important. Sorry I have only a few minutes here, but let's go on to catastrophic hazards. You know, massive in scale, like the Cascadia subduction zone event, which this conference wouldn't be complete without mentioning that we had this other factor, not just climate. Um, so the severe ground shaking, subsidence, landsliding, liquefaction, Yahoo, doesn't last very long, but it'll be a new world, a new Oregon, and a new America when this earthquake hits. And as Dr. Moat pointed out, it could be in 50 years and it could be in five minutes, uh, to add a little excitement to our day. <laughs> In case you haven't had the chance to review this, it is awfully fun to see how very regional this is. That um, USGS, of course, we're all over earthquake monitoring and it's so cool to see the technology moving forward. Unfortunately, our earthquake preparedness technology has not kept a pace with our ability to study this. So I bring this to your attention to think of more opportunities for us to start thinking about what we know is going to happen. And as Ms. York pointed out, preparing for this also uh, helps us to prepare our communities to become more resilient in many other ways. Earthquake frequency, you know, every 500 years, maybe I'll just flip through these, but since the most recent one was in 1700, we are a little bit overdue, and that's in magnitude eight or greater, the kind that levels whole villages in Peru, that sort of thing, yeah. Um, and here's our basic subduction zone model in case you haven't had a chance to see this. It's worth mentioning how very significant this is for the coastal region of Oregon. <clears throat> um, but I want you to invite you to consider the intersection of these two classes of risks. For an example, with increasing storm severity, coastal beaches will migrate landward. Um, could be significant. Um, and think of this, storm hazard risk for residents of the nearshore coastline that storm hazard risk will increase, as a, we saw that eroded uh, bank uh, by the housing development, that if you think of maximum floodwaters coming down from a big storm event, meeting higher sea levels, that tsunami zone is an extraordinarily high risk place to live, fun to recreate in the summertime, um, and we can use that kind of information to make better decisions about public infrastructure, right? Adapting to public, uh, to these hazards, the combination of them. I want to invite us all to consider that our public water supply infrastructure was built on snowpack hydrology assumptions that no longer hold. I would like to suggest to you that protecting our public water supply, we could make our highest priority. Let's think about this. No water, no civilization, right? And we've been doing what with about public water? It's time pastime to start em emphasizing. And I'd like to suggest to you really that all water belongs to the public. It belongs to the earth. We get to borrow it. If, it, if we're good stewards, it will still be there for us. Um, and so, of course, the or state of Oregon is doing a huge amount of risk assessment with a strong focus on land use planning as a key tool to help decision makers like city councils and county commissions to make better decisions about infrastructure investments such as ports, bridges, roads, water supply, and energy. Some of our opportunities mean we could really mobilize to start investing in our public infrastructure now. 
And our main health concerns, I, I think I won't cover since uh, Ms. York did such a nice job with that, but especially to think about our vulnerable communities, what big public health issues these are. And in particular, addressing that we are already talking about people who have limited access to health care, such as the people of Josephine County who always rate high on those hazard maps. So some of the things to think about, uh, we are trying, going to recover from the timber harvest of the 1960s through the 90s if we leave our trees in a more or less standing condition. It's a great resilience strategy, and so I hope out of this conference will come strategies to make sure that we never repeat the disastrous clear-cut forestry that has happened. I'm told that it can't be done, but did you know that almost half of Oregon has been clear-cut in the last 15 years? and shipped overseas. Stormproof your watershed. Um, my other Dr. Garden will speak to that in more detail. I want to consider that uh, the area of land use planning is a fertile ground for our work together to protect those hazard land uh, zones, hazard, la hazard landscape zones from development. And in particular, let us end the practice of poisoning the public water supply with pesticides. Why are we using these chemicals? We could bring this to an end. There's no reason for it. Um, grow the local economy for food, fiber, and medicine, and engage the children. Take them out for a hike. Thank you so much.